All right. Well, good morning, Trinity Church. Let you guys get your seats. Whether you're joining us online or you are here with us, thank you guys so much for joining us and being with us this morning. We've got a few announcements. 
And the first announcement that we've got is our SING conference. A couple of weeks ago, we had our first SING conference, our first SING night, and it was a wonderful time of, uh, of singing with uh, each other, with the saints, and, and of prayer, and uh, we just had a great time to fellowship with each other. And so in two weeks, actually in next week, next Sunday night, we're going to have our next SING conference conference. That's going to be at six at night, going to 7.30, around 7.30-ish, and uh, it's just going to be a wonderful time. Now, during these sing nights, we're only going to uh, allowed to have about 40 here in the sanctuary, so we're going to ask you, if you are planning to come to this, please reserve your spot. You can go to trinitychurchmh.org, and you'll see the sing conference label right there, and you can reserve your spots right there, so um, hope you, you can be here with us. Um, most of you know, but these are our prayer cards and guest cards. They are, if you look on the uh, chair backs in front of you, there's a bunch of these. Uh, if this is your first time here with us, or you've been with us uh, for a couple times and you just haven't filled one of these out, we'd ask that you fill this out so we can have a record of you come in. We'd like to get to know you a little bit. Uh, also, in, on the back side, there is a prayer request side. If you have some prayer needs that you'd like to share with us, we'd love to partner with you and pray with you about those. So you can fill these out and drop them in one of the boxes out in the foyer, and we'd love to pray with you. We've got a few announcements. Um, fall celebration. So fall celebration is happening soon, November 1st. We're asking for you guys to mark your calendars and be ready for that. It's going to be one service. So no, November 1st, we're going to have one service at 1030 outside at the terraces and a big canoe. And I'm pointing in the right direction, I think. So right over here. Oh, it's over here. Okay. <laughs> Correct me. Thank you. So over, okay, over this way, uh, the terraces at Big Canoe. It's going to be a wonderful time. Um, guys, no, services like this are great for our church where we can come together and fellowship. And those of you that know uh, Dana Blackwood, he is going to be coming to join us and uh, he's going to be leading the service that day. So it's going to be a wonderful time to kind of just see him again and uh, thank him for everything that he's done for our church. Um, real quick, I want to give a um, um, just a little plug for Mission 7118. If you guys are interested, anybody here is interested in Mission 7118, please reach out to me. This has been a great week for kind of getting the ball rolling and starting some momentum for Mission 7118. Um, we have a, a few of you that have even signed up to be a volunteer and have gone through some of the training. So I thank you so much uh, for investing in that. So again, if you are interested in being a Mission 7118 volunteer, please reach out to me. And finally, a big announcement in the life of our church. Operation Christmas Child. Every year we do Operation Christmas Child, and uh, it is something that I love. A lot of churches around the nation, a lot of churches around the nation, are doing the same thing. And so Operation Christmas Child is a huge project for us. Now, uh, if you know anything about this year, year 2020, things have been different. And Operation Christmas Child is different this year. Uh, we're not going to be packing the boxes ourselves and shipping them off ourselves anymore. OCC has gone virtual. So uh, these kids will be getting real boxes, but we won't be packing these boxes. So you have two options if you want to contribute to OCC. The first one is you can write a check to the church and on the memo line you can put OCC. Each box is going to be $25 and that includes the shipping and everything that you're going to need for that. But each box is $25. And so if you'd like to purchase one, two, three, or four, you can put on the memo line that the, that the money that you've put on that check, it goes to Operation Christmas Child, and those will contribute to our boxes. The second way that you can um, contribute to Operation Christmas Child this year is you can go online uh, and personalize your shoebox. This is really neat. So you can actually go online and choose what goes in your box uh, for each child and and I think that's a neat way to kind of personalize this. Uh, now, if you do choose that option, it's still going to be $25. But if you do choose this option, we ask that you use a link. There is an online link um, that you need to use so that our church can track how many shoeboxes we've actually prepared. Uh, if you look out in the foyer, there is one of these flyers, and on here it does say trinitychurchmh.org. Now, there is a very long link 
um, very long link that you're going to need to put in uh, to, to get to the right spot on the Operation Christmas Child website. Um, but please make sure that you do that so that we can keep track of how many uh, shoeboxes we've done. The reason we're doing that is because our church has a goal of 550 shoeboxes this year. And so that is a lofty goal, but I'm sure that we can do it. And our deadline for purchasing these boxes as a church is November 23rd. Um, so please make plans to go ahead and either purchase through a check to the church or go online and, uh, and make your purchase and pers personalize these shoe boxes uh, before the 23rd. We've got a short video that we want to start with this morning that just shows you a little bit about Operation Christmas Child. This year has been a pandemic year. Children are hurting all over the world. People are afraid, families are scared. People have lost their jobs. They don't know where to go, what to do. They don't know what hope they have for the future. Well, I want every child to know that God loves them, that God has not forgotten them, and that he cares for them very much. And when you pack a shoe box and send it to Operation Christmas Child, it gives us an opportunity to give that box to a child and do it in Jesus' name. Can you just imagine the hope and the thrill and the joy of when a kid opens up a lid like this and all these toys are in it? It's an incredible gift. And so I just want to say thank you. We need your help this year more than we've ever needed it because of the pandemic. It's just going to create a lot more opportunity. Thank you and God bless you. And remember, pray for the children of the world.
if there is anyone worthy of our praise, it is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, right? He deserves our praise. It's so awesome, isn't it, to have an object that is worthy and perfect and awesome and wonderful um, for our praise. So let's sing together about our holy God. I love it. Are you glad to be in the house of the Lord this morning, even on this rainy day? He's worthy, right, for us to come out even on a rainy day. <laughs> um, 
but we're going to do an old hymn. Is that okay with you guys? I love this song because it talks about the faithfulness of God. He never changes. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So let's sing this about his faithfulness. Be encouraged. Nothing can touch us aside from his will and his providence and his perfect plan in life. So just enjoy your faithfulness. Father, you are faithful to us, even when we are not. You are faithful to us. What a wonderful promise this song sings of, that we can trust in you. Lord, you are faithful, and you provide everything that we need. Everything. So, Father, as we have received everything that we need in you and in your Son and the gift of the Holy Spirit, Father... Allow us to give back to the work that you are accomplishing here on earth. God, I thank you for a church that is giving. I thank you for a church that sees the importance of the gospel going to all nations. I thank you for a church that sees the importance of the gospel being spread right here in our community. Father, we thank you. We praise you for giving us a people that have that heart 
to do your work right here. Father, here in a few minutes, Jeff is going to come and and preach. And Father, I pray that we hear your word spoken. I pray that our hearts are turned towards you. And if there are things that we need to repent of, Father, strike us with that. May we repent and turn towards you. Father, we love you. Be with us during this service. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him. Today's scripture reading is found in 2 Peter 1, 1 through 11. I'll be reading from the NIV. Hear the word of the Lord. Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ have received a faith as precious as ours, grace and peace be yours in abundance through the knowledge of God and of our Jesus, our Lord. His divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Through these, he has given us his very great and precious promises so that through them you may participate in the divine divine nature, having escaped the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. For this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness, and to goodness, knowledge, and to knowledge, self-control, and to self-control, perseverance, and to perseverance, godliness, and to godliness, mutual affection, and to mutual affection, love. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, They will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But whoever does not have them is nearsighted and blind, forgetting that they have been cleansed from their past sins. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, make every effort to confirm your calling and election. For if you do these things, you will never stumble, and you will receive a rich welcome to the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. Thank you. Wonderful words of from God's word as well as wonderful words that we've been able to sing this morning and just uh, express our praise to our faithful God, our holy God, all that we described about him in our singing this morning. Good morning, Trinity Church. So good to see you here. Thanks for being here, making the effort on on a messy, rainy, crazy kind of day to come out and to be here for worship. Thanks for that effort. And, uh, 
Just to add my word to uh, what, uh, what Nick said about the Operation Christmas Child, uh, this is a, a big, important campaign for us every year. We uh, do want to put a lot of effort into this, even though it's going to be a little bit different. We won't have the stacks of boxes out in the foyer reminding us every Sunday like we normally do. But even without those reminders, please, please participate as, as best uh, you can. And uh, we really want to uh, fulfill and reach our, our goal here this year. Um, but most important, we want to do this for the kids. As, as Nick said, even though we're filling the boxes, creating them virtually, the kids don't get virtual boxes. They get literal boxes with toys and things, and they also get the gospel. And that's the important part of this, what Samaritan's Purse does. Every presentation of gifts includes a presentation of the gospel, and our missions committee adds to each of our gifts to make sure that there's this discipleship program that's in, included as well. And so these kids hear about the word, and they, if they respond, they are given more. They are discipled in their faith right from the start. And so uh, we, we love this partnership with this ministry. And so we've got a next couple of weeks here, so jump right in. Don't wait until middle of November to, to try to catch up. That's going to take a little more work on your part, perhaps, but you can do it at home. You don't even have to get out to Target or Walmart to fill your box. It all happens right online. So uh, please participate with us this year. Uh, let me uh, start us with a word of prayer here as we go into the Word and just ask God to be teaching us and guiding us and directing our time together. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this, uh, this privilege this morning of being together. Thank you for the privi privilege of worship. Lord, I thank you for the, those that are joining us online that have connected and, and pulled us up on their laptop or TV or phone or whatever. They're, they're connected that way to what we're doing and, and worshiping wherever they are. So I thank you for that part of our congregation as well. And I, I thank you that we can connect our, our hearts and lift our voices to express this praise to you this morning. You are good, Lord Jesus. You, you have given us all that we need. And we are so thankful for that. And so this morning, as we come to your word, I pray that you would help us to respond, to listen well, to hear what you want us to hear, and, and to grab a hold of it and respond to it the way that we want to, that you want us to. And uh, Lord, I pray that it would be a response of thanksgiving and gratitude come from our hearts of praise in us, because you have given so much to us. May we give back what you have so generously given to us. And so this morning, Lord, I pray that you would give us that focus, help us to, to hear from you, but also to respond to you, to be doers of your word. And Lord, I pray that you would guard my words, help me to accurately, rightly communicate this truth. Thank you that you've given us your living revelation and that it makes a difference in our lives today, each day. And so help us, Lord Jesus, to hear you. And may it be the ministry of your Holy Spirit at work in us, speaking to us, changing us, counseling us, comforting us, guiding us. Well, all that we need this morning, you will give that to us in the person of your Holy Spirit. We thank you for that. And so we commit this time to you. We commit ourselves to you. Speak to us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So it was the summer of 1967, and it was known as the Summer of Love. Now, maybe some of you remember that. Maybe you participated in it in some way. Many of you here were probably born long after that. But it was a, a unique event, a unique summer, because during that summer, an event happened on June the 25th. It was the first live international satellite television presentation, and it was called Our World. And this was a big deal. It was, it was transmitted to about 25 different countries, 400 million people tuned in. I mean, uh, it was all in black and white, but this was a big deal in, the, in 1967. And as part of that event, the very popular musical group, the Beatles, were invited to sing. And some of you perhaps remember that 
no-name group. And so they were asked to come and sing and be a part of this live broadcast and to bring a song that would be very simple English, because this is going to a lot of different countries, but a song that would bring a message to the world. And so here they are. There's a colorized version of all this that came out later. So here they are in, in full color regalia. And so they wrote specifically for this occasion and sang for this particular occasion the song, All You Need Is Love. Now, if you saw the video that Beth and I put out yesterday, you heard me singing along with a, a track of this. So Beth said, I can't sing it this morning, so I'm not going to sing it for you today. I'm sorry. I would have loved to do it, but Beth said, no. So, you know, what can I do? But this song was such a hit. It made it to the top of the charts in Great Britain, many other places around the world, became so well-known. People, even today, all these years later, know it, sing it, you can still hear it on the radio. All you need is love, love. Love is all you need. Well, about 20 years after the event, in the 1980s, what some people consider the materialistic 80s, this message of this song was kind of torn apart a little bit. It was, came under criticism. It's too simplistic. All you need is love. That's ridiculous. Or naive to think that all you could possibly need is love. And so they went back and they asked one of the Beatles, George Harrison, they said, what do you, do you still believe in this song? And he said, absolutely. And here's his quote. He said, love is complete knowledge. If we had total knowledge, then we would have complete love. And on that basis, everything is taken care of. It's a law of nature. So is he right? I mean, are the Beatles right? Is all that we need is love? Well, we've chosen the title a little different than that. Not all you need is love, but just the phrase all you need as our title for this series that we're starting today in Second Peter. And we've chosen this title because in this book of Second Peter, Peter tells us that God has given us everything we need to live our lives for him. So what is that? What is the most important thing? What is it that we really absolutely, fully, completely need to live the godly life? Well, we moved, we're going to find out. We moved right from 1 Peter into 2 Peter. You know, we finished that book last week. We moved right into 2 Peter this week because there's really a lot of ties, a lot of similarities. It's the same author for one thing. This is still Apostle, the Apostle Peter who's writing this, this letter. He's writing at perhaps similar time frame. So we said in 1 Peter was probably written somewhere around A.D. 64. Best we can tell from history, Peter was martyred about 67 or 68. So somewhere in there in those couple of years, he writes again and writes this letter. From one thing he says in there about my previous letter, we'll see that in a, in a little bit here, in a couple of weeks here, that we think that probably, unless there's a lost letter, this was written even to the same people, those churches in Asia Minor that we've been talking about the last few weeks, maybe the same audience, although he doesn't identify them specifically. And it's very likely Peter is still in Rome, writing from Rome. So you got a lot of the same setting, but the theme is so different. The focus of this letter in 2 Peter is completely different. So remember in 1 Peter, he wrote that letter to encourage these believers in Asia Minor who were suffering for their faith. They were going through persecution. And so Peter writes to encourage them in their faith. But in this letter, in 2 Peter now, he's challenging believers to mature in their faith, to grow in their faith, so that they would be able to resist some false teaching that was going on, some skepticism about the Lord's return that was coming at them. So he's challenging them to grow, to mature, to strengthen their faith so they could stand up against this false teaching. So the tone in this letter of Second Peter is a little more confrontational. It's a little more direct. And you'll hear that in Peter's words. So to give you a basic approach to the book, let me just turn our, a phrase, turn a metaphor that's often used in sports. So maybe you've heard the saying, a good defense is the best offense. 
So that applies to team sports like football or soccer or basketball. The meaning is if you can play good defense, if you can stop the other team from scoring, then you have a much better chance of winning, even if you don't score a lot. A good defense is the best offense. But in the spiritual world, and what Peter's going to describe in this book, it's just the opposite of that. A good offense is the best defense. A good offense is the best defense. So in other words, the way you protect yourself from those attacks of theological error and spiritual skepticism is to make sure that you are solid in your faith, growing in your faith, pursuing your faith. You're offensive in your spiritual growth, and that enables you to defend yourself from those attacks. So this is the emphasis of this book. Turn, please, to 2 Peter if you're not there already. Amazingly, it comes right after 1 Peter. <laughs> You'll find it right close to where we ended last week. So in your phone or electronic device or pick up your Bible, look at the first part of 2 Peter. And we're going to dive right into this, uh, this passage today and into this book study. And our first principle is really the theme of the book. Followers of Christ have been given everything they need for godly living. So Peter starts with a fairly straightforward standard introduction. He says, Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who through the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ have received a faith as precious as ours. So Peter understood that even though he was an apostle, he was also a servant. He recognized that, yes, he had authority to speak as an apostle, but that ultimately he was a humble servant of Jesus Christ and that his readers were on the same level as him in terms of being recipients of this faith, which he calls, by the way, this precious faith. The word for precious here was a word that was used of the privilege of of citizenship. So if you had Roman citizenship, that was a valuable commodity. So he's saying here, this is valuable to us. This faith that we have is precious. It's valuable. And that's not only true if you're an apostle, he says, for all of us, for his readers, and for us now 2,000 years later, this faith is precious. We share the same faith. And Peter says in verse 2, he goes on, he says, Grace and peace be yours in abundance through the knowledge of God and of Jesus Christ our Lord. So grace and peace, those are the typical blessings one would start a letter with, but here they mean specifically they are the blessings of a relationship with Jesus. That's what comes from being related to him. But he adds in here the word knowledge. And don't miss that because that word is going to come in one form or another 13 times in this book. In in only three chapters, 13 times Peter will use this word knowledge. And so it's obviously a key to understanding what he's talking about. Because his theme, his emphasis in the book is that just knowing about God, knowledge about him is not enough. The knowledge that Peter talks about is a relational knowledge, an understanding a personally connection, a personal connection to Jesus himself. So he dives right in, verse 3. His divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. So at first glance, it seems like Peter is just overstating his case, okay? He's given us everything we need for a godly life. And when I really evaluate that, I think, do I have everything? I mean, if if you're like me, I have a lot of days where I struggle. There's temptation, there's sin, I, I, I fail to do or to say what I know I should. Do I really have everything I need to live a godly life? And and I liken it almost like, is Peter just being here like a good coach? The coaches are supposed to say to their teams, you know, you can all do this. You can all be superstars. Is that what he's doing? Or like the the sales manager who tells all of his salespeople, "You you all have the potential to be salesmen of the year. When everybody knows it's really not true. 
Is that what Peter is doing? Is he saying, you could all be spiritual superstars, spiritual giants? Is, is he just kind of putting it out? No, it's not that. He's not just trying to puff us up. He's not, not just trying to give us confidence. What he's saying is that we have this not in and of ourselves, but we have this because of the power of God. Notice how he says this. His divine power has given us all that we need. So what is that? The power that God has given us is his very Holy Spirit. It's the spirit that he places in us at the moment we come to faith in Christ. The divine power is in the person of the Spirit. And that is what we need. But there's more to that because he uses the next phrase. He talks about this knowledge of Christ in us, and that's the relational knowledge. Here's where he's saying, because we have a connection to Jesus himself in all of his goodness, so he describes it here, in his goodness and his glory. So in all of his greatness and glory and in his goodness and kindness to us, in the knowledge of that relationship, we have all that we need. As a Christian, you have the power of the Spirit and you have the personal knowledge of the Son. But that's not all yet either. So now in verse 4, he goes on. He says, through these he has given us his very great and precious promises. So through these, meaning the glory and the goodness of Christ, because he loves us, we have been given these great and precious promises. So what are the promises? It's the promises of God's words, the promises of, of forgiveness and salvation and eternity in heaven. It's the promise that God will be with us and help us and walk with us every day of our lives. Those are the promises. It's the promise of the word. And Peter's saying, because we have that, we have all we need. Everything you need in your life to live your life for God. He has already given you. And the power of the Spirit, personal knowledge of the Son, the promises of the Word. And so Peter then makes, then following that, this outrageous, what seems like an outrageous statement. He says, so that through them you may participate in the divine nature, <clears throat> having escaped the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. So what is Peter saying here? Participate in the divine nature is he saying that we become like God? Okay, step back a minute and evaluate this. this. This word participate is a word that Peter's used before. We've talked about it before in 1 Peter. It's the word, the Greek word koinonia, a familiar word. It means fellowship, partnership. And so, just the same way Peter said in 1 Peter, we have this partnership, this identification with Christ in his suffering and in his glorification through a relationship with him. Now, Peter is adding to that, he's saying, you also have a, this participation or fellowship in his very nature. It, it's what, what Paul says, too, in 2 Corinthians 5.17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone, the new is here. That new spiritual nature that we've been given as believers. And that nature, that spiritual nature cannot be corrupted, cannot die. That is what lives forever. That's the guarantee of our eternal life. And so that's why Peter describes it here. It, it, through that, we escape the corruption in the world caused by evil desires because of that new nature that we've been given. It's a divine nature. It's God's nature. It's spirit nature that he puts in us, not of the world. It's of God. Participation in the divine nature. This last week, our grandson Nathan turned one year old. And some of you that have been here for at least a year, you'll remember a year ago, I was telling you about this crazy story of, of him coming so fast. He was born at home. The fireman had to come in and, and deliver him at, at home. And he's now a year old. 
So this is our daughter, Lindsay, with him, and, and uh, this just taken this week for his birthday. And when he was first conceived, his DNA was made up of his father and his mother. In a sense, he shared their, or borrowed from their DNA. So he's his own individual, he's his own person, and he, he looks like Nathan, but he shares that, that DNA, that coding with his parents. And so he has in him, at the moment of conception, he had in him all that he would need for life. All, all the pattern, the code was all written already. That's the, the amazing thing about God's creation of life. Now, he had to grow into that, and he's been growing like crazy. It's been so fun to watch him over this first year of his growth. But it was all there from the very beginning. And this is what Peter is telling us in a spiritual sense. He's saying, at the moment you come to Christ, the moment of your conversion, God gives you all that you need for spiritual life. It's all there, the whole package. The code is written for you. But you got to grow in it. That divine nature must be developed. It needs to grow. And so that's where Peter goes to next. He, he carries us on. He's saying, so you have this, the Holy Spirit in you in power. You have the personal knowledge of Christ within you. The promises of God's word. It's all available to you and applicable to you. You need to grow in that. And that's where he takes us next. And so our next principle is followers of Christ have a responsibility to grow in their faith. You've been given a faith that includes everything you need, but it must grow. Notice that Peter starts verse 5 by connecting this exhortation to what he's just said about having all we need from God. He says, for this very reason. What's the reason? Well, the reason is we have God's power through his spirit. We have a personal connection to the Son with the promises of the word. Okay, put all that right back in the package. Because of that, make every effort to add to your faith. Really important phrase. Okay, let's camp on that for just a minute. Make every effort. So wait, wait, is Peter saying we have to work for our salvation? No, no, please don't misunderstand what Peter's saying. He's saying, well, you already have been given faith, you've been given all that you need. Now you come alongside, you cooperate with what God is doing in your life, and you work with him to grow that faith. It's the same as what Paul says in Philippians chapter 2. He says, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you. God works in you. God has given you faith. He's given you the gift of salvation. Now you work on that salvation. You work on that faith. You develop that faith through God's work in you. Martin Luther said it this way. Maybe you've heard this phrase. He very, it sounds very much like what James says. We are saved by faith alone, but the faith that saves is never alone. You're saved by faith, but it's not just to stay there. You don't just put that faith in your back pocket and hold it until you get to heaven someday. No, the point of the faith is that you add to it, that you develop it, that you grow in that faith. And that's what Peter is talking about in this passage. And so this word for add here is really helpful, really inf informative. So when he says add to your faith, kind of the second part of this, yes, you make every effort, add to your faith, then you should be asking the question, well, wait a minute, you just said we had everything we need. Why do we need to add anything to it? Well, the adding is the growth. So this Greek word is, is much longer than our three-letter English word. The Greek word is epikorygene. Now, You'll see the root of that word in just a minute. Paul draws this or borrows this from Greek culture, as he does a lot of his phrases and words in his writing, because that's what he lived in. And in the Greek culture, the, the drama festivals were a huge event, very popular. And so what would typically happen is the state would provide the funding for the chorus, as it was called. The chorus were like the actors who would sing and act and so on. But then there would need to be a benefactor, 
And in, in the Greek, this was a korygos. That's what it was called. A korygos would be that person who would bring the resources and the funding to add to what was already there. And so the training for the chorus and maybe the backdrop, whatever else was needed for this production to happen, the korygos would provide it. And from that Greek word, that root, we get our word choreography, right? You've heard that word, so that means like when there's a stage production, maybe you've gone to something like this. The choreography is, is the, the set, the movement, the music, the things that are added to the script to bring it to life. And that's what Peter is saying here. Essentially, he's saying, choreograph your faith, Add to it. Make the effort to bring to your faith all that God has for you, all that he's so generously made available to you. And what is that? Well, Peter goes on to rattle off these seven virtues, character traits, goodness, knowledge, self-control, perseverance, godliness, mutual affection, and love. Now, okay, any of those seven words could be a sermon or more than one maybe on its own, right? So I'm not going to take time this morning to go in and explain each of those words. In fact, in a sense, maybe this is your homework. Because Paul sa uh, Peter says, make every effort. Well, part of your effort needs to be to study these seven character traits. What are these qualities? What do they look like in our lives? What does Scripture have to say about it? Well, that's a great study for you to do that you need for yourself. If Peter is saying these are the qualities that are important to be adding to, developing in your life, then you need to know what they are and what they look like in your life. And so do that work. Take Peter's words seriously. Make every effort. Invest the time and effort yourself into studying these character qualities. Grow in your faith. But why do we do that? Why make that effort? So here's where I want to go for the rest of this time this morning. Because the next four verses, Peter gives us the motivation. He tells us why this is so important to be growing in our faith. And here's our third point today. Followers of Christ who keep growing will reap earthly and heavenly benefits. So in these four verses, Peter gives us four results of our growth in these character qualities. First is in verse 8. <clears throat> For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge, there it is the word, key word again, of our Lord Jesus Christ. So here's the first motivation. Spiritual growth keeps you from ineffectiveness and unproductiveness. Now, I don't know about you, but when I hear those words, that's motivating to me. I don't want to be ineffective in my life. I don't want to be unproductive in my life, in anything I do, especially in my spiritual life. And so this kind of grabs my attention. I said, well, okay, wait a minute. I, I, this is important because I don't want to end up ineffective and unproductive. I don't want to be useless and fruitless in my life. Why would, I, why would anybody want that? So Peter's saying, well, then you need to take this seriously, grow in these areas and these qualities. And I think what he's telling us here is that these, you don't have to manufacture these, they already exist. Part of what God gives us is this potential. That's, there's the spiritual DNA. We have that potential with these spiritual character qualities and the, and the Holy Spirit at work in us. But that divine nature, those divine character traits need to be nurtured developed, cultivated, so that they will grow. And then the fruit comes as a result of that. So a little over a year ago, when Beth and I moved into the house that we're living in now, our, the yard, uh, the grass in, this, in our yard was terrible. I mean, it was, if any of you talk to us about stuff, you know we were, we've been fighting for a year to get this grass. It was thin, it was weak, it was, uh, the soil under it was terrible. The, uh, uh, we had weeds all over the place. And so we've been working on this. But this early this spring, a neighbor down the street, when the grass started gr greening up, her yard looked better than anybody else's. I mean, it was deep, lush green. It was was thick. Like, what is she doing to her grass? We got to know this. And fa thankfully, Beth had already developed a relationship with this neighbor, knew her. So we just went and so we just asked her. We said, what are you putting on your grass? She said one word, malorganite. 
Well, if you've, I don't know if you've ever heard of that, but melorganite, it, it's, the name tells you a lot. So it's organic, organ, it's, it's nitrogen-based, nite. So what is the mill at the beginning? I wanted to know. Beth looked it up and she found out about this. Well, it's because it's from Milwaukee. That's what the M-I-L is at the beginning. Well, that got our attention to our kids, our son and daughter-in-law. They live in Milwaukee. So what is this? Well, the city of Milwaukee has this program where they take some of their, okay, their waste products and they create out of them, they recycle it to become fertilizer. So we spread a bunch of Milwaukee all over our yard. <laughs> And it worked. Within less than a week, we already saw a difference of it greening up and getting thicker. So we put a number of them, and then a couple months later, put some more bags of that on. And thankfully, now some, that's not all the malorganite. God also sent a lot of great rain all this summer, and that helped our yard a lot too. The point is, you don't just do nothing. If you have a garden or a lawn, if, if you want it to grow, you got to work at it. You've got to cultivate, nurture it, fertilize it. And, and Peter is saying here, if you don't want to be unproductive and unfruitful, then you got to do the work. you got to make the effort for spiritual growth too. We need to put something into it. We need that spiritual enrichment so that there will be growth. It's cultivating the soil of your heart so that you don't end up ineffective and unproductive. Keep growing, in other words. There's another warning that comes in verse 9. But whoever does not have them, these character traits growing in them, is nearsighted and blind, forgetting that they have been cleansed from their past sins. So here's another critical statement. So here's a motivation. Spiritual growth keeps you from blindness and forgetfulness. So you've got to take the negative and flip it over into a positive. Spiritual growth can keep you from that. So he's talking about this, of course, in a spiritual sense. So what he means is that if we are not intentional about spiritual growth, then we will lose sight of what God is doing in our life, the goals that he has for our life, the things that he's done in the past for us, we'll forget it all. We'll lose our focus, we'll lose our spiritual sight if we're not developing, growing spiritually. And so that's what Peter is warning us about. He's saying, you need this. If you're not moving forward in your faith, you will lose sight of what God has promised you and what he's already done for you. And we don't want to end up there. Peter reiterates his call to do the work of spiritual growth in verse 10. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, make every effort. There's the same phrase again. To confirm your calling and election. For if you do these things, you will never stumble. So, again, a lot here in this one verse, one phrase here. What does he mean by confirming your calling and election? Well, clearly that's God's part in our salvation, right? We have nothing to do with that. God, God elects, he calls, he chooses, and then he calls us to salvation, to himself. We respond in faith. But he is saying, Peter is saying here, you need to confirm that call and that election of your life. How do we do that? Well, this word confirm is a legal term that was used for validating a will. And so he's saying here, essentially, spiritual growth is the validation of your faith in Christ. You demonstrate that you belong to him, that you have been called by him by your pursuit of spiritual growth. Again, Peter's saying that's why it's so important. And then he's saying if you will do that, if you do these things, if you're pursuing spiritual growth, that keeps you from stumbling. For if you do these things, you will never stumble. Well, what does that mean? Does it mean we'll never sin, we'll never fail, we'll never fall? No. No, Peter is kind of describing the big picture here, the long-term effect. He says you will not fall away permanently. You won't stumble to the sense where you are off the charts, off God's radar. No, he says God has you. You won't be left behind. If you're making the effort to grow in your faith, God's going to be right there with you, and he won't let you stumble. That's the idea. 
So I, I, when I read that, I think of a harness and the ropes that you wear if you're climbing. So if you've ever done a climbing wall or done rappelling or anything like this, you, you know you have to kind of get used to that. You have to get, learn to trust that harness and that rope that it's got you. And once you have come to that point where you have confidence in that, then you are free to climb. And you can begin to move up, move forward, because you know you won't fall. The harness and the rope has you. And I think that's what Peter, it's a beautiful picture, what Peter is saying. He's saying, God's got the harness and the rope on you. So you go after it. Be aggressive in, in, in pursuing spiritual life and growth, because God's not going to let you fall. He's got the rope. He will not let you stumble. Pursue him, run with him, go with him, climb with him. Make every effort. There's one more thing that God gives us in this passage. God promises us the benefits of spiritual growth. So the first three are in this life that we've talked about. So we're kept from ineffectiveness and unproductiveness if we're pursuing spiritual growth. We're kept from blindness and forgetfulness if we're pursuing spiritual growth. We're kept from stumbling if we're pursuing spiritual growth. But then there's an eternal reward here as well. So this is where he goes in verse 11. It says, you will receive a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It's this beautiful picture, because now Peter is looking long-term. He's saying, you are kept from all these things on earth, and you are kept for eternity in heaven. And your spiritual growth is your pathway there. And then with these words, rich welcome, Peter, again, he's pulling on a Greek culture. This is back, we talked about this last week with the Greek, or the week before, maybe the Greek Olympics. And so when the Olympic athletes would, would win an event, when they would come home to their hometowns, there would be a great celebration for them. And that part of Greek culture, we kind of carry it over to our culture, right? So when a team wins the World Series or a team wins the Super Bowl, what happens in their hometown? There's a ticker tape parade, and they go through the city, everybody cheers. It's like, it's like everybody won. And that was the case there too. And that's the metaphor Peter is using. When he talks about this rich welcome, he's saying, when you get to home, to heaven, there will be a welcome, a celebration like you cannot imagine. For those who pursue God in faith, he is planning the best welcome home party there could ever be. Years ago, I read a book by Max Licato called The Applause of Heaven. And when I read this verse, it reminded me of how he ends that book. And I wanted to share that with you as we close, just to read this last part of that book for you, because he, he likens our home going to heaven to arrival on a flight. When you get, you're flying home, especially maybe after a long time away or a long flight, and you're finally home. Listen to how he describes this. You'll be home soon. You may not have noticed it, but you're closer to home than ever before. Each moment is a step taken. Each breath is a page turned. Each day is a mile marked, a mountain climbed. You're closer to home than you've ever been. And before you know it, your appointed arrival time will come. You'll descend the ramp and you'll enter the city. You'll see faces that are waiting for you. You'll hear your name spoken by those who love you. And maybe... Just maybe, in the back, behind the crowds, the one who would rather die than live without you will remove his pierced hands from his heavenly robe and applaud. You will receive a rich welcome. Peter says it's all worth it pursuing our faith, growing in our faith, because the Lord Jesus waits to welcome you home. We're going to close the service today with a song called Oceans. I'm going to ask the team to come on up and be ready to lead us. It's, there's a veiled reference in this song to an experience that Peter had, walking on the water 
Well, he walked for a while, and then he began to sink when his faith began to waver. And so this song kind of picks up on that, this, that idea, and it reminds us that Peter, the very one who began to sink because of his weak faith, is the one who wrote these words we studied today about faith, about growing in our faith. And Peter obviously did. From that moment on the water to the time he wrote these words, Peter grew immensely. He's a great example of exactly what he calls us to in this passage. We all have the potential for spiritual growth. Peter's living proof of that. He knew that Jesus had put that faith in him and given him everything he needed to grow. He just needed to grow. He had to get out of the boat and walk on the water. And so do we. And so as we close, uh, this really is going to serve kind of as our, our closing response prayer. I hope that you will sing it that way. Think of the words as you're singing along or listening to the team. I want to read a couple of the words of the chorus to you so that you hear them loud and clear when they come. Spirit, lead me where my trust is without borders. Let me walk upon the waters wherever you would call me. Take me deeper than my feet could ever wander, and my faith will be made stronger in the presence of my Savior. He's given you all that you need. So make every effort to grow in your faith. Let's stand and sing.
oceans rise, my soul will rest in your embrace, for I am yours, and you are mine, yes, I What a great promise, isn't it? That we belong to him. He is ours. We are his. If this morning you have any uncertainty about that, that you belong to the Lord Jesus Christ, that you have a personal relationship with him, please come talk to me, any of our elders or deacons who have name tags on. Please let us know. We would love that opportunity to walk you through that step of personal faith in Jesus so that you can have that relationship with him and have assurance of that home going and that reception in heaven. So please talk to us before you go today if you have any concerns. If you're at home and you're watching the service and you have any doubts, please reach out to us online. Call the church office this week. We would love that opportunity to tell you how you can know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. If you have any prayer needs or just want to know more about Trinity, please ask us about that too. We'd love that opportunity to pray for you. Let me leave us, close us with this blessing, this benediction this morning. Receive this, Trinity Church. Trinity Church, you have everything you need for a godly life. It's been given to you by God. So this week, make every effort to grow in your faith. May the Lord be with you. Amen. Have a great